Hey, hi everybody. I think we're going to get started. Uh, so welcome to our session on micro-mobility as a solution to urban traffic congestion. I'm going to take a moment to introduce our speakers. So we have um, Emmett McKinney from Super Pedestrian, who's actually joining us virtually through pre-recorded videos. So if you have any questions for him, you'll have to find him on your own. Because <laughs> uh, he won't be able to answer them. Um, and he's going to get he uh, is going to give us the insider perspective as an operator of micromobility as a solution to urban traffic congestion. And then we also have Andrew Glass Hastings from OMF with us. So Andrew has extensive experience in leadership roles at the intersection of the public and private sectors. He served two mayors in Seattle, managed local and regional transportation funding campaigns like transit and mobility for the city of Seattle and advise cities around the world. Currently, Andrew is the CEO of the Open Mobility Foundation, very recently, it's so easy on him, uh, a public-private partnership between cities and private mobility providers, co-creating data standards uh, and open source software tools. And his email, which he so graciously gave us in his bio, is andrew at openmobilitydatafoundation.org. So with that, we'll start with our 20-minute video, so bear with us, and then we have a really exciting interactive session uh, planned for you. This, during this 20 minute video, this is a great time to text all your colleagues and friends and tell them that this is going to be the best session of the conference. <laughs> <laughs> like, this is, this is the sort of what speaking at you portion. And then you're not going to like just sit and listen to me talk for 60 minutes. It's actually going to be more about you talking. And we're going to do what uh, is called a human mobility spectrogram. Basically, pose a bunch of statements, and then you get to decide whether you agree or disagree. And then have a conversation about why and why that is. So you're going to go to, if you agree, you're going to go to one side of the room. If you disagree, you'll go to the other. And then we'll hear from each other about sort of why you think the way you do. So it's kind of learning from each other more than more than anything. There. Uh, my name is Emmett McKinney. Uh, I'm a senior product manager for data ops and integrations at Super Pedestrian, and I'm thrilled to be speaking with you today about micromobility as a solution to urban congestion. And um, before we dive in, just want to thank the conference organizers, Mobility Data, um, as well as Tuto, especially for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Unfortunately, wasn't able to make it in person this time, but really look forward to engaging with you all soon. Um, so first, a bit about Super Pedestrian. We spun out of the MIT Sensible City Lab in 2013 in order to solve urban transportation challenges. Um, our core technology for that is called vehicle intelligence. And we spent eight years developing that uh, in a lab, as well as two years operating that um, uh, on Link scooters, uh, which, which is the brand you would see in the streets. Um, our core values are that we're trusted partners, innovators, and above all, city people. Because we grew up out of the lab at the MIT Department of Urban Studies and Planning, that urban mindset is really in our DNA, both as staff um, and on our vehicle. Uh, a few key stats. Uh, we currently operate in over 60 cities in 11 countries. I believe we just launched in Germany this week, um, making our 11th. And we've done almost 10 million trips um, for about 23 million kilometers. Uh, some simple math shows that that's 2.3 kilometers on average, um, and 64% of our trips are actually under five kilometers. So um, we think of our technology as a really useful tool for addressing those trips that are just too long to do comfortably on foot, but aren't quite long enough that you would need to drive. Uh, a bit about me. Um, I, like I said, in this product, I'm the senior product manager for data ops and integrations. Uh, my team manages our mobility data specification feeds, our general bike share feed specification feeds, as well as our mobility as a service integrations. Uh, and broadly, I'm responsible for any data that we share with cities. So that means that you know, I do some data viz and some GIS myself as well. Um, but I wanna point out for purposes of this talk that I didn't start off my career in data. Uh, I didn't study computer science, not software engineer. Um, I'm actually trained uh, as an urban planner. And that's the framing that I really used to think of about my, my work in data and the direction of my team. So a question I think about a lot is how are we complementing public transit? Um, and, you know, this is a big topic both for this panel and my work. So I like to boil it down to uh, a few key tenets uh, of, of how urban transit systems work. Um, so transit planning 101. Um, the first truth is that cities are just more dense in certain areas. We like to live near each other, work near each other. A lot of us live downtown, fewer of us live on the outskirts. Um, there's an uneven density across the urban landscape. Um, the second key point is that um, building and operating a fixed or transit network costs a lot. 
from acquiring the land, building the infrastructure itself, so the tracks and the stations, um, from acquiring the vehicles to run along those networks, hiring the people to drive those vehicles, and developing the technology to make it all run smoothly together. Building fixed route transit just is a big undertaking. Um, and the third piece is that transit networks are most useful when service is frequent. If I stepped outside right now and wanted to catch a bus downtown, I'd want to know that it was going to come in five, maybe 10 minutes, you know, frequently enough that I don't have to change my day around it. I can just know it's going to be there when I need it. And so these three key points that cities are unevenly dense, that building, that there's a big cost to building extra a transit network, um, and that frequency matters a lot, um, sort of brings us to the point that any mobility system faces a trade-off between ridership and coverage. So ridership is the number of people that you can expect to ride along the network, along a given link coverage, uh, which is how far the network expands. If you have a bigger network with more kilometers of track, that means that you need more buses to keep the same amount of frequency or say more trains. Um, and that's that's expensive, right? So if you have limited resources, then you can either build, build a network in a place where you expect the most people to ride, that is in the densest areas, or extend it really far, but you're always trading off between those two precepts. So it's coming back to our question of how micromobility and transit work together. Um, this is a useful framework. Um, transit, because it's expensive to build, is often built for ridership and it's fixed in place. This makes sense. We see subways and rapid transit systems connecting um, population centers and running through the densest parts of cities. Um, and that makes transit really good for longer trips, moving a lot of people, um, serving uh, you know, predictable travel patterns, right? helping people get point A to point B at rush hour, um, as well as predictable locations. So transit's really good for destinations along the route. Um, and all of this depends on transit moving in a dedicated right of way, be that a dedicated bus lane, a subway tunnel, an elevated track. Um, it takes a lot of space. Micromobility lands on the opposite side, so it's more flexible and can be used for coverage. Uh, specifically, it's really good for shorter trips. Like I said at the top, two thirds of ours are less than five kilometers. Uh, because you can only put a one person on a scooter at a time, it's good for moving a few people. Um, it's really helpful for off-peak travel because the infrastructure itself is more flexible. That means it can be used for weekend travel and midday at the same time as being you know, in the, in the right places for the, for the rush hour travel. Uh, it's really good for out of the way destinations, places where only one or two people may need to go. And critically, it fits in neatly to a shared right of way. So, you know, you would expect a scooter to be ridden in the same lane as say bikes or shared with cars. Um, we mix in with other modes using the street. Um, and so we really think of micromobility and transit as complements. They're, they are both bound with the same basic challenge of urban transit and they work together in an integrated system. Like I said, we're city people, we're big transit enthusiasts, and we're always thinking about how to make our scooters work better with transit and extend its reach. Um, so the next question then is what makes any mobility system work? Um, one of my favorite thinkers on this topic is Jarrett Walker. Um, he wrote a book called Human Transit uh, over a decade ago now, but I think its basic precepts really ring true. Um, a good mobility system should take me where I want to go. Um, with our scooters, this makes it really useful, or that makes our scooters really useful for getting um, into a, you know, into nooks and crannies like this one. You can see a narrow alley with some interesting shops and restaurants, cobblestones, probably pretty hard to park a car in there or run a bus down that street. Um, we want our scooters to take people where they want to go, when they want to go. So making them both available downtown during rush hour um, and maybe on the outskirts for a weekend and off peak. Um, it's really important that scooters are available. Um, transit should be a good use of time and money. Riding scooters is really fun. Uh, and we, we keep that at the center of our design, both of our user interfaces and the, the vehicle itself. Um, Similarly, we think it's important that, um, uh, that our scooters respect riders. We recently rolled out a fleet of seated scooters and we have long prioritized safety um, and have an industry leading technology in that respect. So we have a really comfortable ride that makes our scooters available, uh, access, or excuse me, makes our scooters accessible to folks from all walks of life. 
Um, it's important that our scooters are trustworthy. Uh, we have regenerative braking on board, so you can take them downhill and they're not going to, to run away from you. You actually feel safe while you're riding it. Um, and we have ops teams out there dedicated to making sure that they're in good shape, that the scooters are taken on the street once they are needing in need of maintenance and that they have enough battery to take you where you need to go. And lastly, one of the pre precepts of human transit is that it gives me flexibility to change my plans. Um, and this, I think, is where data is really critical because it's what allows us to integrate our scooters into a fixed transit, into a, a, an integrated transit system that gives users a lot of different options uh, at a particular time. So. Uh, what role does data play in all of these? I sort of alluded to it, but I think we can actually map our different data products um, that we work on onto each of these different principles of, of human transit. Um, so the first three um, are, you know, it's a good use of my time. It's a good use of my money. It takes me when I want to go. To my mind, that's what GBFS addresses, right? And specifically, it makes our scooters accessible on trip planning platforms, like say the Transit app or Google Maps or City Mapper, that help riders know how much it will cost to go, how long it will take them to get there uh, on our scooters, how that compares to other modes, and what is available when. Um, the second three principles of it takes me where I want to go, I can respect it, or it respects me and I can trust it. Uh, I think that's what MDS really speaks to. Um, MDS uh, gets used by cities, um, by urban planners to plan out their policy and infrastructure to both make sure that scooters, um, have a safe place to ride, that there are bike lanes, protected rights away for, for riders to use micromobility safely, um, and also to hold operators like us accountable to make sure that, our, that we are respecting riders, to make sure that we're respecting cities and the public rights of way, um, and to make sure that our scooter are trustworthy, right? Via MDS, we report things like the state of the battery, how often they're picked up and dropped off, where they're accessible, when a scooter becomes non-operational in the field. And all of those help policymakers and riders have trust in the system. So we think MDS really speaks to that. Um, and lastly, on this point of about, about giving riders freedom to change their plans, transit integrations and mobility as a service really are oriented around helping people compare options and know at a given place in time what their whole suite of, uh, of options is to get where they need to go. So uh, now we're getting you know, down to the nuts and bolts. What makes data good technically? Um, so we operate around a few key principles. Um, here's a snapshot of our GBFS feed, uh, and that highlights our first one, which is that it should be open. By making our data accessible to anybody who wants to go see it, that means new platforms can build it, cities can see where our scooters are, uh, and it makes it really easy for us to spark new integration because we can hand somebody a URL, they can check out our data and see if there might be room for collaboration there. Um, you can see our URL here on screen. I encourage you to go check it out and see, see how we might be able to work together. Um, but our GBFS feeds are, are open as they should be. Uh, the second is that it should be reliable. Right? Just like a scooter, data should be available when you need it. Um, and so we, we're proud that our, our APIs maintain over 99% uptime. And that's key for, for folks to be able to know that not only the hardware is going to be there when they need it, but the software is going to be, and the key information is going to be there when they need it. Um, our data should be fast, right? It's important that since we have a lot of scooters on the ground and have a lot of information to report and that a given trip planning platform have a lot of information to report on that we can move it through our APIs with low latency. Um, it should be standardized, right? That's kind of the whole point of this conference that we all speak a common language and that a given platform that's reading our GBFS feed and it's reading and they're reading a GBFS feed from every other bike or scooter sharing service, we wanna make sure that platform can um, can read all those in in a standardized format. Uh, and finally, it should be complete, right? That data should come with interesting metadata on when it's last updated, its version, when the last time it was it was um, cached, um, and those metadata help the help a particular server know what to expect and how to format and interpret that data. But you know, I, I think a more interesting question than what makes data good technically is. What makes it actually useful um, within the context of an urban transit system? And in this respect, I want to highlight a few projects that Super Pedestrian has worked on um, that I think speak to this point. Um, first is that we think data should be really responsive to specific user needs. Uh, the case study for us here is GBFS 
2.3. This is the most recent version. And it brings along some new innovations. Um, one of them is scooter seated um, as a type of vehicle and vehicle types JSON. Um, that's really useful for us to communicate where our specialized scooter is available to, to users who want to know um, if they'll be able to ride in the seat. That's useful for folks with a disability or just folks who prefer a more comfortable seated ride. Uh, current range meters. Um, I'm not sure if that's a GBFS 2.3 feature, but we definitely still provide it. That's useful for um, telling users how far they can expect to go on a scooter um, and you know, what their radius is. Uh, and lastly, this is a feature that's in progress for us right now. Um, it's the idea of station parking in the geofencing zones. Um, that's a new way of denoting systems like, say, San Diego uh, downtown, where there are uh, a broad area where you're not allowed to park except for designated stations uh, within it, kind of like a lily pad in a pond. Um, so we've been intentional about adopting uh, all three of these features as, as soon as we can, um, quickly after they're published. And I specifically want to highlight Scooter Seated, which we stood up uh, within the GBFS working groups and said, we'll go ahead and implement that. Um, we did that before it was an official part of, uh, part of the standard when it was still um, a release candidate. And because we stood up and said, we'll implement it, implement that and did it, we could nudge the whole standard together and help GBFS 2.3 be released. So in addition to being responsive to user needs, being proactive about that and being an early adopter, I think really nudges us all forward together as an industry. Um, so the second thing that we think makes data really useful is when it's supported by policy. Um, an example for us of this is in Los Angeles, we are integrated with the Transit app, which is the official trip planning platform of LA Metro. Um, and so we did this through a simple GBFS integration featuring a deep link. Um, and in Los Angeles, we have a really generous equity pricing program where we do um, 30 minute uh, free trips, I believe for income qualified riders. And after doing this for our first six months of operation in LA from, let's see, last August to, to this spring, we went back and we looked at where these equity trips are happening and how folks were using our service. And we were stunned to see that 28% of those were first or last mile trips. That means they were either starting or ending away from transit and starting or ending near transit. Um, that is to say, people were using our scooters to connect um, to the station or get from the station to their final destination. 28% of those trips fell into that category. Uh, fully 43% of those trips happened in areas where there was no regional transit available. Um, so combined, that means that 71% of the trips that we were offering through a low income through a uh, yeah, low income program were addressing unmet transit need. Um, so that pricing made our service accessible and the transit integration made it reliable, made it dependable, made sure that people could discover that scooter when and where they needed it. Um, so again, that to us speaks to the fact that data is a key piece, but is most effective when it's combined with, with progressive policy. Uh, and lastly, we think that data is most useful when it's organized for impact. Um, we share MDS data with, with many cities. Um, we're happy to do that. We think it's a, it's a really impactful standard. Um, and in two cities where we operate, Los Angeles, one of the biggest ones, Asbury Park, one of the smallest ones, they both use MDS data to expand their parking programs um, to make sure that there was a safe place for riders to start and end their rides. We think that's a perfect use case and we're really delighted to see our data contribute to that. Um, and so for that reason, we, we have recently engaged with the U.S. Department of Transportation Safety Data Initiative to, to take it one step further and combine our MDS data with information on, on crashes, on available infrastructure like sidewalks and bike lanes, and user surveys to really identify the safety needs of all street users sort of at a systemic level. Um, and as I mentioned before, we partner with Populous to do this. Um, so this is a screenshot of their uh, mobility manager platform that's aimed at helping identify high um, high risk areas to ride, places where uh, we see a lot of scooter ridership and places where there have been reported safety incidents. So by layering together our MDS data with other key information about urban transit systems and the rider experience, we can really organize the data for impact. Um, and again, we're excited about that because we're urban planners and we, we like to see a safer city and safer streets for all. So where does that leave us? Um, the main takeaway I want to leave you all with is that data is key but insufficient. Right? Great mobility systems grow from meaningful engagement. 
Um, the lessons specifically that we take away um, and sort of integrate into our practice are that it's critical to understand riders and transit agencies goals. Uh, I spend about half my day speaking with engineers about the nuts and bolts of our APIs and half my day speaking with city officials and with government partnerships folks to understand the overarching policy goals and identify where good data might fit in. Um, a second key principle is that we want to make scooter data accessible. Um, by sharing MDS data with cities, um, we open the possibility that they can then share it with their partners. Seattle and Austin share MDS data through open data feeds. And that's great because it allows um, the broader public to make use of that data and identify needs that maybe um, we haven't identified as operators or that governments haven't identified yet. It really democratizes that, that information and we think that's great. Um, a third principle is that we like to partner with organizations that visualize and explain. Um, I'm comfortable sifting through JSON data. Um, I bet a lot of people in this room are as well. Um, but it's valuable to make that data beautiful and to make that data really intuitive to, to engage with, to folks whose expertise lie more in policy or law or finance or development. Um, data is only useful in as much as people can you know, put, it to, put it to use. So we like to make sure that, uh, that they can do that. Uh, a fourth idea is that it's really important to work through trade-offs and technical working groups. Um, forums like the OMF um, working groups to hammer out the the, the pieces of that mobility data specification are useful in tackling some of the more thorny policy issues, right? Things related to right of privacy, things related to how fast you need to send your data, how much of it. Um, data is really valuable and sensitive information. And so we wanna make sure that we are giving it, that we're sharing data that's useful in a format that's useful while also looking after um, the privacy of our riders uh, and making sure that we're designing standards that are actually feasible to implement uh, you know on a time scale that cities can work with uh, and once those details and trade-offs are hammered out it's important to lead the way to, to stand up and say we'll implement that uh, because you know within these working groups often with our with our other colleagues in the industry we want to make sure that we're all moving along together and that there's an even playing field and that means that we should step up and be leaders and say we'll try that out we'll we'll work through trade-offs and we will um we will bring our findings back to the group so understand goals make data accessible partner with organizations that visualize, work through trade-offs, and lead the way. Uh, those are the key uh, lessons that we've taken away and I think challenges that I would issue to most folks in this room. So um, that's that's all I got, um, but thank you so much for the opportunity to, to speak here. Um, I wanted to leave my contact information on the slide. If you ever wanna chat data, scooters, or or um, or really anything else, please drop me a line at emmett.mckinney at superpedestrian.com. Um, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks all. Any questions? <laughs> you can email. I, mean, yeah. I will say that uh, uh, how many of you have written uh, uh, not necessarily a super pedestrian scooter, but just one of the shared electric scooters? Yeah, yeah, have you written one? No. Okay, so most people, but the, so we have in Seattle, we have their scooters, and they're actually one of the, the better devices out there. They're a little, little larger, a little more substantial, so they definitely feel safer when riding it. Okay, so I mentioned uh, we're going to try the human mobility spectrogram today, and with the group this size, we can make it pretty informed. Um, I've done, done this activity with uh, sort of plenary sessions that have 100 plus people, and so it's different in that environment. But here we can we can make it a little bit more uh, uh, a little bit more informed. So I'm Andrew Glass Hastings, and I run the Open Mobility Foundation. And the Open Mobility Foundation is uh, it's a public-private partnership between cities and private sector companies, uh, focusing on uh, developing. Uh, data, mobility data standards, as well as uh, software tools to help cities manage mobility in the right of way. So we help steward the mobility data specification, MDS, which you've heard a lot about, um, bits and pieces about uh, the course of the conference, as well as CDS, the curve data specification. And unlike GTFS and GBFS, which are very much consumer-facing standards, 
meant to make it easy for you to find out the, the location and arrival time of your bus or train or where you can find a scooter on a device or a platform like uh, Google Maps or Transit. Uh, NBS and CDS are internal facing tools for cities and other public agencies to use to plan, manage, and regulate the uh, uh, mobility services in the public realm. So as you, as you heard Emmett talk about how, uh, how Superpedestrian uses MDS because it's, uh, it's a requirement to operate in the cities in which they operate. And that's the way that the, the city and the scooter company, in this case Pedestrian, Superpedestrian, are, are speaking the same language. And that the information can flow to the city, the data can flow to the city uh, in a way that uh, they can easily ingest and understand and then make sure that the scooter company is adhering to the city's rules and regulations. Uh, curved data specification is similar in that sense. It's focused on uh, digitizing curb rules and regulations to help, uh, to help make the interactions between uh, operators and users of the curb and the city managers, regulators of the curb um, easier. So think about yeah, all of the laundry list of parking rules you see on physical signs today. The, the CDS and what we're working on in, uh, with our uh, public and private partners, the Open, Mobility, the Open Mobility Foundation, is digitizing that information so operators such as UPS, FedEx, Amazon, um, even uh, you know, DoorDash, food delivery companies, uh, the Ubers and Lyfts, as well as, as general consumers like you, know, you and I who want to park on the curb can have, uh, can have easy uh, access to those rules and regulations. Uh, let's see, okay, so talking about a little bit about Spectre, what is that? So this presentation will walk through a series of statements and the statements are meant to be somewhat provocative and then you get to decide whether you agree or disagree with the statements. And you can also be in the middle. So just like think of a, of a spectrum, you, know, you can fall somewhere on that spectrum. If you completely agree, you'll be as up against that wall. If you completely disagree with the statement, you'll be up against this wall. And then you can fall somewhere in the middle if you kind of are, are in, in the middle of the road there. Uh, let's see, so then, and then we're gonna have, I think one of the fun parts here is you know, I'm, I'm, I'm only a, you know, a micromobility expert in that I've worked on it from a, a few different angles, but you know, we're all mobility experts in a lot of ways. And so you know, the opportunity here is for all of us to, to hear and learn from each other about uh, the mobility sort of systems that we all use on a daily basis. It's one of the things that I love most about transportation and also can be one of the most frustrating things about transportation when talking to my friends and relatives, everybody thinks they're an expert, right? Because we all use the system on a daily basis. And generally, we're all multimodal on a daily basis, whether that's walking from our house to the, to the bus stop, or um, actually you know, getting, having, getting in a car and driving, and then um, uh, having to walk to our final destination and, and various uh, scenarios in between. Okay, so just really quickly, a few ground rules. There's no right or wrong answer here. So, this is, it's, you can't really hide in the crowd in this, in this sense, but, but really there's no, uh, there's no right or wrong here. The statements don't, they don't reflect my opinion, they don't necessarily reflect OMF's opinion or Mobility Data's opinion. They're just sort of positioned from different uh, perspectives to be provocative. And then, uh, you know, hopefully we'll have a chance for everyone to offer some of their opinions about these statements. Don't criticize others. And then, it, of course, we can debate, we can have, we can challenge, but, you know, challenge respectfully. And then uh, we'll have an opportunity to just raise hands if you if you want to share. Okay. Any questions? <laughs> okay. So we start we start off. Yes. Go ahead. What is that agreement? Great. I'll, I will remind you. So um, so we're going to practice. So this is like stand up stand up. This is uh, like moving around. All right. So this is an easy one, right? Okay. So uh, warm up statement. Summer is the best season of the year. If you agree, go to this wall over here. If you disagree. Go to this wall, and then if you're somewhere in the middle, like yeah, you got like summer, but yeah, winter's nice with snow. You can be in the, in the middle there. Okay, so it looks like we have we have some summer lovers. Huh? Okay, who wants to say why? All right, go ahead. The first, the first say emissions. It's easier for them to 
get into their mindset that you know, the summer it's easier to start a new, let's say, a new activity. Ah, sure. There you go. Okay. Okay, we got some middle of the road. What, what do you think? I think summer is school. Yeah. You can do your body. And the winter, you can do your race. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. You mix the different form. Perfect. Perfect. All right, what about What do you think? Uh, because I have also awesome seasons, and uh, I believe they have less, you know, uh, French. French. Uh, and so these are more, they are more things you can do uh, in the business, like autumn and spring, but maybe different from Canada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's uh, not really too warm, and you don't can do anything in French. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Everybody is working, so. <laughs> All right, absolutely. Uh, anybody else want to share on this one? Free. And also, feel free when you do share if you want to say your name and, and where you're, uh, what organization you're from, you can get to know each other. All right. Okay, that was an easy one, right? Okay, so, so what's next? All right, so statement one micromobility ridership will fully recover. So, all the ridership on scooters and bikes that, that dropped like almost to nothing during the pandemic will fully recover pre pandemic levels by the end of the year. Again, it doesn't you don't have to be an expert? You don't have to. There's no right or wrong answer. It's just kind of what's your what does your gut say? What do you think about uh, about this? <laughs> Again, we're gonna we're gonna if you agree with this statement. If you think ridership on bikes and scooters will recover over here, if you don't think it will recover by the end of the year, go over here and then kind of in the middle. All right, what do you think? Well, I was originally going to say yes, but the little issue that we going to go past the levels of. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So right. So optimistic ridership on bikes and scooters is going to surpass pre-pandemic levels. Great. Okay. How about how about over here? Who's um, there? I know because the the global level of mobility has been not the same. It's like in professional sport, not the same for yes. in Europe. So all the yeah. so my mobility is not there. Is that in, yeah. Okay. Maybe one or two years more. Okay. Okay. Take a little bit longer to get back to those levels. A bit more. Yes. Okay. How about how about over here? What do you think? Uh, I think we will uh, definitely increase. We see that we have some uh, data from the BC, from back to Montreal yesterday, and I think that we increase the compared to last year, like in Australia, we see that we have some data from the BC, 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 it works, but um, in my opinion, you know, there are some large cities, New York, yeah. uh, Chicago, yeah. DC, have the, the docks. It's the same company. It's the same as There you go. Okay. And, uh, you know, I think those docks, one of the things you heard Emmett from Super Pedestrian talk about is the, one of the tenets of, of, you know, that Jared Walker talks about in human transit is reliability. So I'm not sure if like a scooter, a dockless scooter program or dockless bike share program provides that same level, I could have made a statement on this, right? Um, provide that same level of reliability as knowing like day in, day out, there's a dock that you can go out there and reliably get a bike like every morning for your morning commute. I mean, sometimes there are, in Seattle, sometimes there are bikes near my house that I can get and sometimes there aren't. So it's hard to rely on. And like I said, it could be another topic, but it's just funny because here in Montreal, we've got scooters a couple of years ago and it was dockless. And then you, it was kind of a pilot, one summer pilot. You didn't remove it at the end because it was everywhere. The companies were not following the rules to put it some spots or something yeah. like that. So yeah. you just cancel the project. Yeah. So it's just funny that now you're do all doing all in the class, but over here it's kind of the opposite. Yeah, it's only looking about the station mm -hmm. mobility uh, services. And, yeah. and I might have another short question. Go ahead, go ahead. What about scooters versus bicycle? What are the benefits? Why? Oh, we'll get into that just a minute. Okay, good point. Does anybody, uh, does anybody here know how the transit ridership has been doing sort of during the pandemic in Montreal? Yeah, I think we're, uh, I don't know if it uh, was. Uh, 40, 40, 40. Yeah, it's on the 
but it, is it still 40% or? Because my, my friends at the in Laval, <laughs> okay, so it's 60%. Yeah. Okay, 60%, but it's still 60%? Yeah, or? yeah. Now, okay. Because in Laval, I heard like a three quarters, but let's say 60 three quarters. Yeah. Okay, it's still, so still below, but so yeah. bicycle ridership is up, yeah. and transit ridership is down. Yeah, I think that's an interesting relationship. Okay, anybody else on this one? Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, I was thinking about the home industry, work from home mm -hmm. uh, phenomenon. Yeah. So I was wondering what, how does that affect? This is why I'm about here thinking about yep. that phenomenon. Yep. Yeah. And so if, if people use scooters or bikes to commute, but now they're commuting less, or they're working from home more, I mean, that's gonna drop right. Mm -hmm. And I think you're seeing that uh, even on, on public transit as well. People aren't, they're not commuting as much anymore. Right? They change their commute patterns. All right, next one. So here you go. E-bike share, so the electric bike share, will prove to be more popular than shared electric scooters. <laughs> So this is a thing to think about, like kind of whether, the, and because here, obviously in Montreal, you've got the, the bike share, you've got an amazing system that actually has e-bikes and non-e-bikes mixed in, don't have scooters anymore, but a lot of cities have both. So, and then also we know, someone mentioned that you know, uh, bicycle ownership and the purchase of electric bikes is increasing across North America. Okay. So this one seems interesting. So e-bike share will prove to be more popular. Okay, let's start with those who think kind of in the, in the middle here. Uh, I believe the, the, the both uh, solution is pretty sane yeah. because you you move. I think it's the reason why I, okay. I am yep. in the yep. middle. Photo. It's pretty similar. Okay, what do you think? My question is popular with who, right? Yeah. Um, I, Great point. I come from the equity space, so I am always question those type of questions about like popular group for the yep. people that are, you know, riding the bikes or for people that we want to ride the bikes. Like how do we go about it and, you know, influence them to ride the bikes. Yep. So the equity question it is, that's why I'm in the middle of some like Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Over here. If we, if we talk about the long term, um, um, e-scooter could be a step, but at the end of the story, you choose a bike because it's more comfortable. So e-bike is more comfortable than bike, and bike is more comfortable than e-scooter. And so you can try it if you compare. Yeah. And if, if it's for every day, for example, yeah. it's more comfortable. So when, I don't know. Yeah. But at the end of the story, I think it will be bike, bike share, so e-bike share. Do you, think, do you think it's interesting? You can, of course, as an individual, go out and buy an electric bicycle today. And we know those those purchases are increasing significantly. You can also go out and buy your own electric scooter. And you know, I think those, those numbers have also increased, but they're far lower than people buying electric bikes. So I, I think that's an interesting, I don't have the exact statistics, but I think that's kind of an interesting snapshot that people are choosing to buy these devices. Many more people are choosing to buy bikes. And I wonder if that's because you know they're more comfortable, or the they're more they're the utility of them. Meaning you can perhaps even put a passenger on the the back of a of an electric bike, or you have a basket where you can put groceries or put other things. That that utility aspect is a little bit more difficult on scooters. Yeah, consider the, uh, the uh, quality of the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 yeah. Sorry about that. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 But the rule of so um, you know little in, on a on a scooter. Mm -hmm. So when you saw the street of Montreal, you don't want to uh, fall in the <laughs> 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 hole because of yeah. but, and, but anyway, in, in Paris, yeah. in Paris, uh, the, uh, the bike are more popular, and the electric bike for the dock electric uh, dock sharing electric bike are very very popular, yeah. and they're not the same use, and um, the scooter e scooter are more like a touristic use, yeah. and they are very limited in the area, in yeah. the very center of Paris. And you don't do the same thing with it with shorter uh, distances, and uh, and you and I don't think that you know Parisian or people that are living in the area are using that much uh, e-scooter, but they are still using a lot of Vélib and 
and especially uh, right. Yves Yeah. Mm. Do, do you think in, in Paris, do you think a lot more visitors use the scooters? Oh, uh, yeah, okay. totally. Yeah, but it, it depends. It, it, uh, so it depends on the information you have to <laughs> to rent. It's okay. It's okay. Not, <laughs> not rent to rent a bike because when nice. like you know <laughs> when you have the lime or the jump or um, application, it's like very universal. It's the same in Paris in, in a, a lot of cities. Yeah. When you want to use in Paris our system of bike sharing, yeah. it's like <laughs> if you have not. Uh, PhD, uh, <laughs> you can use it. Yeah. You know. yeah. So I'm familiar with that system. So yeah. with the language, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You, you have to give a lot of information about yourself. You have a specific um, yeah. car, uh, um, uh, visa from confirmation. Yeah. You have to have uh, some um, yeah. uh, deposit. You have to have a big deposit. So you have a lot of things. Yeah, speak, uh, speak. So it's, it's more. Uh, but uh, you have it everywhere, so you can be very. You, you don't need a license. To, uh, to drive a, a, a scooter or no, e scooter is protected. Oh, you do. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't know. I don't know about. about the, I don't know about the. I don't know about the Paris and France, but uh, okay. in, in U.S. cities, I'm actually not sure about Canadian either. But when you sign up for an account, okay. you have to show your license. Not to. Not because you have to have a license to use it. They need to uh, verify your age. Because okay. they all have uh, age restrictions. It's like yeah. But, uh, but in, in Montreal, you, when you're using the e-bike, you have to have a a net. So yeah, 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 yeah but, but I didn't use it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in France, it's not, it's not mandatory. But, but I think you bring up a really important point in thinking about you know those that do travel around to different cities or different countries. You know, if you are a user of the mobility services, and not just micro mobility, but if you're a user of, of Uber, and if you're a user of Lime or Tier, then you can go to all these cities where they operate, and the interface is the same thing. It's universal. Yeah, it's universal. So, but if you want to try to use a transit system here in Montreal, or use a system in San Francisco or in Paris, you're everyone's having to learn a yeah. system all over again. And there's. Change of country, you have to change the city in France. So anyway, <laughs> so, so, so that, that seems right there. That is a really that's a disadvantage mm -hmm. for public transit. It makes it so much easier to use these. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But at the same time, I also feel like the barrier to entry for scooters is higher because, like, for adults, a lot of older adults or people that have never ridden a scooter, it seems like why would I get on that thing? <laughs> Like you are anchored to a bicycle and like most people have ridden one throughout their life. So if they were going to do one of them yeah. and also something I found like while traveling in different places is like there's Link, there's Lime, there's whatever. And I don't know what app I need to get on that one. And there's like 10 different. So it's sort of like the almost like decision fatigue is higher. I feel like there's like, oh, a citywide system. Okay. Like I could probably figure that one thing out, but I, I kind of almost see it the opposite in that way. That's an excellent point. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it's expensive, e scooter. Yeah. It's very expensive. Yes. All right, we'll get to that. Yeah. If you compare. All right. Yeah, it's a question of demographics. So I think the bicycle, the e bike, you will cater to a more older yeah. public yeah, than, sure. than, than scooters. Yeah. And I've, I've got one, one question, you know, in regards to uh, ridership. Um, we see, let's say, Big C uh, share, bike share program is. But we also see at the same time, um, you know, traffic from the outskirts getting worse and worse. Yeah. So this is something that I can't really wrap my head. Yeah. You know, uh, um, well, so, so yes, wrap my head around. Transit is yeah. down. Mm -hmm. Traffic is from especially right. suburban. That's right. That's up. right. Bike share, but bike share is pretty urban, right? It's pretty centrally located, so that's up. So our, our especially people that are needing to come into the city. Are they, where they may before have used public transit to do that, are they now just deciding to drive instead, which is driving up traffic volumes? Yeah, that's kind of an interesting result of the, the pandemic. Okay. Oops, okay, so this one, question. One, one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, here, you, and uh, we have, it's not possible to, to use the uh, bike services for 12, 12 months. Do you know if, uh, is there another base maybe for, Sweden or but doesn't matter. Yeah. Where you have uh, um, is there a solution? Is there a product that can be run? 
right? Do you know another product where you can work, run with this uh, for uh, 12 months? Are you talking about the, the winter, here, the winter yeah, problem? Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So because, well, I mean, if, if you think about like, it, the invention is not the... No, I, I mean, it's it, the winter problem exists in every, in every city that has you know, a, a bad winter. Um, so that's where you see much higher ridership for you know, things like bikes and scooters in cities that have more have nicer, warmer climates year-round. In Montreal, there is a four-season uh, uh, bicycle program, you know, to, to, get, a, yeah. to get around. Yeah. It's very yeah. interesting. You, you see the user increasing year by year. The user, great. yeah. Or, but there's still no big C. But big, big, big C oh, is big C shuts down? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Big, big okay. C is planning okay. a pilot. Really? The winter pilot. Oh. Wow. That's so a so lot of systems ridership drops. But I don't know of a lot of systems that shut down completely in the winter. They generally Plus, still have the like bikes. Montreal, they, 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 they remove completely. They see higher yeah. All the yeah. ducks are stored. And then the, even the ducks. Yeah, yeah, they are, they are stored uh, somewhere where it's too late. Uh, um, in, in Paris, uh, the, uh, we have this long-term uh, uh, renting for called Veligo, yeah. which has, uh, um, it was working with the uh, PTA, was like, uh, and uh, it was to help people to uh, try uh, uh, e-bike. Yeah. So it's a very good e-bike, but they say that the seasons is not, is, is, they are more um, uh, asking for this. Uh, during the uh, springs and the autumn, and they, have bit, uh, they still have a lot of people, but they are. And for the company, where um, their, their business is about uh, renting a uh, bike, they, are, they have less uh, activities yeah. in, during the winter. So they're more like hardcore biker that they have stay, people who have, have their own bike that yeah. are still, you know, using it during the winter, but uh, people are more like seasonal uh, the rest of the time. It's also it's also an equation. If you don't shut down our roads when it snows, mm -hmm. people can still drive. Mm -hmm. yeah. So part of it is the expectation from you know your city to make sure the bicycle infrastructure is safe and clear of snow. Here it's already new. It's like since two or three years now. So we're yeah. starting. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Montreal, we too have a pilot project, and we use a dog sled. Oh, that's a joke. <laughs> oh, what is it? Dog sled? Oh, dog sled? Oh, yes. Okay. All right. A little more, a little more wonky here. All right. Getting into a, a date. I had to throw in a data question. So, so this, this statement, the micromobility data sharing required by cities. And so you can think about that as both GBFS or the MDS that was uh, we talked a little bit about is important for cities' ability to plan, manage, regulate their transportation systems. You look like what? I'll, go, go for it. I'll say it is, but the ability for cities to use that yeah. to plan, manage, and regulate a better transportation system, yes. based on my experience in US cities, is not true. So that's good why point. I stay good point. <laughs> in the middle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're here. Uh, I would say the same. I would just add based on my Canadian experience. Yeah. <laughs> okay. so, so, so you're making the point that, so collecting data for planning, regulating, managing purposes is good, but you're not seeing cities actually do enough of that. No, I okay. Agree. So that's good, so interesting point. All right, over here in the agree. Who wants to, who wants to go for, over, over here? Well, the of tarification, if it's part of tarification altogether. So this could be very important. And I think as the opportunity to collect data and uh, uh, battery level uh, displacement of vehicle, you know, when there is shortage of a scooter in one place, yeah. and then put it in another, there is a cost to that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not eco-friendly always. So there is a reality beyond the micro-mobility that need to be understood mm -hmm. and then controlled. So that well, two of the reasons why I think this is important. Okay, how about, what do you think? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's important, but like, um, I know we're saying, I guess the videos is insufficient. Um, mm -hmm. I think we, there are a lot of banks on education and of course transmitting it to the public. Yeah. Um, so I think design and, and making it really, really understandable to public officials is really, really important. And this is kind of the thing I don't want to say about the past question, but 
um, in terms of snow removal and whatnot. I think maybe you know, but there's like a city in Finland, right? Um, and they have a whole bunch of snow, of course. And they have their, their kids still ride their bike to school during the winter all throughout the season. Yeah. Um, so it's just like the only place that I saw that was the kind of YouTube video. So if there was just like a better system for cities or people to make known that these things are possible. Yep. Montreal, I'm sure. Great point. Yeah, interestingly about Finland, I learned just yesterday. So Helsinki uh, and major city, major city in Finland. Finland does not regulate scooters because there's apparently an interpretation of the law that they cannot, uh, they cannot impede private commerce. And so the scooter companies, I, I haven't been to Helsinki recently, but apparently there are like there are scooters everywhere and every company is there and they have unlimited scooters and, and the public is quite upset. Oh, upset. Uh, they're quite upset because they're they're the, because the, the government has sort of said we can't do anything. Now I asked the question, I said, Well what about what if I'm a hot dog vendor? Can I set up my cart in anywhere on the sidewalk? And if I want to sell my hot oh, no, 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 we highly regulate that. I'm like, wait a minute, how can you regulate hot dogs but not scooters? Anyway, okay, so right here. Yeah, uh, well, the, the, the question was, is it important? So whether we are able to do it or not, it is important. Well, one thing I would add is that for all types of, of mobility, data, uh, cities, put sensors to try to understand what's going on. So the advantage of micro mobility is that instead of putting sensors, you can just add to the providers, which lower the cost of operating costs for cities. Yeah. So on top of planning, manage, and regulate, there is also the question of being able to understand what's going on yeah. without putting sensors everywhere, which has an, brings issues in terms of technology, in terms of uh, uh, privacy. Privacy, thank you, and so on. Anything else on this? No, what I would just add, and I think that yes, it should be, but I think that all the major decisions are still based on politics rather than data, yep. and all those decisions with data, it's still uh, about cars. So there's a lot of hunting station for cars and all those data, and especially in Montreal, since there's no big seas, no bicycles during winter, for sure all the decisions are made with cars, so. Emmett, you did hear Emmett talk about one case of the, 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 the data being used by a city to kind of help improve the system by creating more sort of designated parking zones, actually areas in the right of way, probably on part of the sidewalk, to make it easier for people to park the scooters. Now, hopefully, you, you think that, especially through MPS, cities can, they can have the trip data aggregated of course so it's not tied to an individual trip but they can see where the scooter and bike trips are happening and then they can should be able to then the planners relate that back to okay where are our bike lanes are people using our bike lanes where are people riding bikes and scooters that we don't have infrastructure and that's where we probably should prioritize building infrastructure because we see a lot of trips in those places now the problem is, is that politics ends up coming into play and so the politics ends up preventing a lot of that infrastructure investment from happening we have this company called Geoville, and uh, they, are, um, they have um, it's a mapping for especially for for um, bike, and it can help um, itinerary have an itinerary mm -hmm. itinerary uh, for biking. And uh, their business model is working with the uh, collectivities because they are uh, you know uh, send, uh, selling their um, the data to the collectivity so they understand what's happening on the bike uh, thing. And is there uh, because uh, I think some the only the business model is only on this, you know, so sending the data of, on biking activities to uh, collectivities. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. If I may add on, the, on, on your point, so in Montreal we had a, a mobile application to track people voluntarily, and we use that uh, to develop some of the bike paths. So we, 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 we looked where people were moving. And, and some of the missing dots in the network were filled because of that. That being said, there are also some places where it's more difficult. So the, the streets that was the most used for bikes, which didn't already have bike paths, was Richard And well, there was a political decision not to put <laughs> any, any bike path on that large, very large and busy street. Okay, last comment, so we gotta move on. There's a fun ones ahead, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's very important as well. 
for uh, uh, cities to put uh, mm -hmm. and territories, not only cities, to put micro mobility where the need is. Because often it can be something that just with tourists or for kids seen as a toy, and the people around just don't benefit from micro mobility. Great, that's an excellent point. Now, where is micro mobility actually being deployed? Because these these fleets of vehicles are being placed by the companies in particular areas. Right. Actually, it was more a question about the, the, the video, the example they gave about the e scoot uh, I don't know, it was like 70% uh, was to complete the transit, so I don't know if it was the first kilometers or it was an area where, where there was no transit, so I believe it was the class station, I believe, so people can ride it uh, anywhere to suburbs and leave it there and people that they after they just take it to go, I don't know, to take the bus after, or uh, yeah. I understood yeah. correctly. I can't, I can't remember what stat. He, he included, I think, one stat that said they're, they're um, income eligible, so their lower income program. Where they, they, I think a yeah. lot of those trips were happening in places that yeah. were transit deficient. Okay. And they didn't have much transit service, and so a lot more trips were being taken on, okay. on scooters. I think the okay. one Speaking of transit, yeah. The next statement, scooters are further eroding transit ridership, already decimated by the pandemic. So you can agree if you think scooters are further eroding transit ridership, meaning scooters are taking trips from transit. If you agree over here, if you think that scooters are, are, uh, are not taking trips from transit, that then you would disagree with the statement, or you could be kind of... Okay. All right, right? Right there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm agree, but I think it's very complicated to prove it. It's a problem, because I, I'm agree in, in, in this uh, issue. Yeah. But we, we don't really... The problem is we don't really have the possibility in Europe, uh, we don't have really the possibility to, to prove and to compare and to mix public transit data and e-scooter bike share data. It's like two worlds. <laughs> and when, when, we, when we want to, to, to mix, to combine, to analyze, it's very complicated. And it's very politic. So it's why I, I agree, but yeah. The reality is different. Yeah, it's, a, it's a great point. That's where a little bit of you know, data, ridership data that goes to transit agencies, some ridership data on micromobility goes to cities, yeah. and how you actually work yeah. together to yeah. tell a complete story. Yeah, but here in the, in the middle. Well, I, I think it's a uh, unique look at membership. So um, I would think that. Um, membership on public transit and uh, e-scooters are the same and this one person will either choose one or the other so I don't think it affects uh, so much the, uh, the membership itself so yeah. here in Montreal there is a, a, a monthly membership uh, but it's more and more difficult uh, to accommodate people who are let's say working uh, three or two days a week yeah. Um, so membership is mainly uh, going on a downfall because mm -hmm. of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So maybe this is where the e-scooter is taking up the slack sure. for membership that are lost since... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. I would say I think scooters are more likely to be taking ridership away, or just taking away people walking. Perhaps like yeah. that's what you would trade, whereas transit is often like longer distances yeah. and more fixed routes. So if I just wanted to walk somewhere and it's just outside of what I would be and I want to get there faster, maybe I'd hop on a scooter for that, but less likely to take a scooter instead of taking the metro. Sure. My Great point. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. All right, over here on the disagree side. I would say, sorry, go, no, go, no. Yeah, go for it. Um, I would say, we already kind of talked about it. So one, often we're seeing that people who are using scooters are tourists mm -hmm. who are likely not going, they're using it for recreation rather than for transportation. And so it's more of a means of fun. I mean, for me, taking the bus and the metro was fun, but not for other people. <laughs> you know, getting on a scooter and going 25 kilometers an hour is fun. So there's that aspect of it. 
And then we also just talked about it just now that often scooters are servicing areas that aren't serviced by bus or by transit. And so it's actually the last mile. And so if transit coverage would be better, although it's expensive, right? If we improve transit coverage, maybe we'd see a better marriage of that. Yeah. But currently we're seeing that scooters are filling in yeah. where transit doesn't yeah. exist. Yeah. Yep. I was gonna say, um, I live in New York, Brooklyn specifically, and to get, New York is very well, is very well um, connected by transit. But if I wanna get to another part of Brooklyn, for example, yeah. I can wait 30 minutes for the bus. Mm -hmm. I can't get on a train because all the trains are going to Manhattan. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing scooters and on bikes as well as ways to connect those those boroughs where there's not a lot of transit or you have to wait a long time. So I don't see scooters as in competition with the transit necessarily. I see it as complementing yeah. the transit system. So. I think that's an excellent point. One, and one thing I'll make, if you look at just a couple of cities' examples that, I, that I'm more familiar with, so New York is one and then London is another, both those cities, the transit ridership rec sort of recovery from the pandemic has lagged, but their micro mobility systems and primarily their bike share systems, London has more scooter more scooters than um, than New York at this point. But those those ridership numbers have have gone up a lot. So it's I, you know it's it's unclear because again we don't have perfect data. We you have to go out and actually understand why these people are choosing the mode for the trips that they're making. But you're certainly seeing this this kind of depressed transit ridership and increasing micromobility ridership in, in a variety of cities. And, and you have to understand the change in, in the patterns in mobility. Mm -hmm. Because they are clearly the, the, the patterns of mobility have changed. Oops. Yeah. So maybe they are drifting towards something where the scooter is a better fit. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that the fact that, doesn't mean that if the scooters were not there, people would go back to the transit anyway. Yep. Yep. Yeah, great point. Uh, uh, seeing that it's uh, sort of onboarding also, so that's a change of where people are traveling every day on the daily. daily. Yeah. And, and uh, they are, if you are um, uh, if you are not for, uh, going to work you know, at your office every day, you don't have like, the, the transit oh, yes. membership. Yeah. So would you pay? So you are maybe using it more your car or something, or maybe your bike because you are. Done. Or well, maybe you have taken I mean, it's a very bad day, but maybe you can using one ticket, but yeah. you will not choose it every day. Mm -hmm. So the way you are traveling is not the same. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it changes. Yeah. yeah, well, fewer people get monthly mm -hmm. transit passes mm -hmm. or monthly bike share passes if they're not having to commute every day. So yeah. Okay, we're gonna move on. Hold your thoughts. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so statement five, cities should not subsidize the cost to ride dockless bikes and scooters. Just put in a negative form. Mm -hmm. So think about, so right now, mm -hmm. public transport is heavily subsidized. We know that either by, you know, by, by the sort of federal governments or state governments, local, but by and large, micro mobility systems, uh, dock, and speaking like the dockless bikes and scooters are not subsidized. So this, is, this question is saying that cities should not subsidize the cost to ride dockless bikes and scooters. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. No right or wrong answer here. Go ahead. I would say yes, they should, but they should also be. I am uh, not sure how to stop. But um, communities that that do not have the necessary transit or darkness bikes infrastructure will not need to pay for them. Other let's say, area codes, postal codes, neighborhoods that have the resources and have the infrastructure should be paid for those that do not have because of systemic yeah. racism and, yeah. and like all of the things that people like all of us try and solve, so. Good, good point. So there's the actual subsidizing the, the rides themselves, but what about the underlying infrastructure? And often a lot of communities have been underinvested in historically in infrastructure. So, DC, Ward 7 and 8 should not be paid for them. Ward 3, 2, where, um, you know, most African people live should. Yeah, okay, all right, over here. Disagree. Yeah, disagree. <laughs> so disagree, meaning you think cities should, generally think cities should subsidize. Yes, okay. and because, for example, if I am a PTA, I must be neutral. So if it's a sustainable uh, mode of transportation, Okay, I pay. I pay for the bus, I pay for the car sharing, car pooling, 
It could be the, freight. The roads, the bridge, <laughs> the highways. Yeah, yeah. So why? Because we more. We must be like neutral and mm -hmm. so yeah, it's no for uh, the other modes yeah. or no for this one. Okay. Yeah, no good point. Hey, thoughts over here at all? Um, yeah, I think just based on like the previous comments that we had of it complementing the larger transit system, mm -hmm. it seems important on that yeah. scale as well as like it is a piece of the mobility puzzle and if it means that people will have their first last mile covered or be able to have access to mobility options, then yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, you agree. Cities should not subsidize. <laughs> what's, what, what, what's your thought? What is your job? <laughs> well, I think that, 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 of course, infrastructure uh, like costly, for example, bike sharing station, but it's not the same kind of cost as public transport. And I think the, the business model is quite viable today for companies to make some profits yeah. and for the pricing to be fair to the public. So I think we, it's like comparing an apple and an orange, you know, yeah. as a balance at this point. And also not uh, uh, subsidizing the, the system could force new micro-mobility alternative, like sharing your own bicycle, uh, sharing your own car, see, and bring some new models that could operate as well as a side. All right. Okay, next. It's kind of an easy one. Okay, so cities need to do more to prioritize safety on their streets in order for micro-mobility use <laughs> to expand. That's a very good challenge. That I did. I did. <laughs> This one I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised there's no benefits. Generally, I think we can acknowledge uh, degree, one degree or another that that cities uh, can be more to make our streets safer for everybody, for pedestrians, for people bicycling, riding scooters. Um, all right, but any any particular fight? Anybody want a comment on this one? The basic question is. Does increase expanding micro mobility help make the streets safer? There you go. Okay, so is this kind of self yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, and okay. people finding says that the, the more you make the more you make it safer for micro mobility, the less safer maybe for other type of users. Yeah. Exactly. Great point. Yeah. So it's a, it's kind of that chicken and egg. Mm -hmm. Do you need to put the infrastructure in order to increase micro, or do you actually try to increase micro mobility, which will lead to better infrastructure? It's probably a relationship there, right? Mm -hmm. But not only this, when people are doing uh, some uh, micro mobility planification, is there you decide to go the, as fast as you can from A to B, the safest way, always maybe the less safe road. So just dealing with safety is not enough to, to solve the equation. Yeah. yeah. Okay, next. Shared electric bikes and scooters are making transportation more equitable. So you think, if you think, have cities having shared bikes and scooters is making transportation more equitable, you can agree over here. If you think cities having shared bikes and scooters makes transportation, or does not make transportation more equitable. All right. Okay, let's start with agree. Uh, because if not, I mean, people, I mean, sorry for my poor people, I don't know, they have no choice, they have no car, they only have transit. Now at least they have an alternative, which is more fun, or at least they have an alternative. So for me, this is why it's more, Okay, more, they have more options. There are yeah. more options presented to travel. Okay, that's a, that's, a, that's a good point. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I don't think they're inherently more equitable. I think equity has to be built into how we distribute electric bikes and yep. scooters. Good because, point. again, in New York City, I live in a predominantly black and Jewish neighborhood, and also a low income neighborhood where we don't even have one of the city bike docks, yeah. so we yeah. can't use it. So if it's not there, it's not yeah. accessible. So I think equity has to be built into the distribution yeah. of my mobility. Yeah. One, one point I'll make there, so one of the values of cities uh, requiring uh, MDS data uh, is that the city can verify where the scooters are being deployed. 
And that, because oftentimes cities will create, part, as part of their permits, requirements that so many scooters or a percentage of the fleet be deployed, especially in lower income neighborhoods. And if the cities before MDS, the cities just kind of had to take, the, take the, uh, the company's word for it. But cities were often finding that they couldn't necessarily trust the operators all the time. So the MDS data is a way the city can verify that the scooters are in fact being placed in these neighborhoods as, as they're required. Comment over here? Yeah. And I would add to, to that, that is totally true. Also for the, so these should be the, the goal. It is not. And another point is that for folks to, for equity to become uh, the way of doing that, the barrier for people to use it has to be easier. Yeah. Not, so the people that we're trying to serve with this do not have credit cards, do not have other things that are currently required to yeah. use shared electric bikes and scooters. There you go. Okay, so it's not just, just putting a scooter there doesn't necessarily make it equitable. Great point. In the middle, thoughts, comments? I would say like my neighbor, not yet. But for example, when in Europe, we don't have like this integration with this kind of private system and public ones, so the price is not the same. And it's, it's more expensive uh, when you take a uh, scooter or shared or bike system. Uh, yeah. So, not yet, but if we improve this integration, we could, we could say, ah, so what we want, it could be better. And it's, so it's linked with the, the other question of subdividing the system yeah, and, and include. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm on, I'm on the fence about it, because yeah. on, on one hand, like I do agree with some of the disagreeing sides of it, is that, um, of course, all these shared e-bikes and e-scooters are new to the system, like new to the city. The only way that you're going to figure out, find out about them is if you have an app or if you have a credit card, it's super easy to just have them go. Um, and, you know, lower income people don't tend to have as much access to those kinds of things, but on the same side, if you just look at, um, like, pay payments, I took a big thing the other day and it was like a dollar and a half, and if you get on the um, metro, it's like 3.5. Yeah. So I think there is kind of like a discrepancy there. Yeah, um, that's a great point. So in that case, taking that, that Pixie trip was what, half the cost of, of the same trip on transit. Yeah. But then also when you use when you use uh, many of the privately operated scooter and, and bike share companies in other cities, you know, almost the reverse is taking place. I remember I took a, a it was a Lime bike, not to pick on Lime, but it was a, so <laughs> they, they have great electric bikes in Seattle, but the trip was $8. And it wasn't a very long yes. trip, and it was eight dollars. I could have made that same trip for two dollars fifty on on the bus. Yes. So, so that's the uh, difference between the the, the, the uh, dog, uh, dog sharing uh, bike, whereas like subsidized cities, and we are less cheaper, far yep. more cheaper, yep. and the uh, private company like yep. uh, Lime or Dot or Tier. I know how many of them in, in Paris now, and, and it's very more expensive, yeah. so it's uh, definitely not the same public but using it. Yep. Um, so yeah. I, uh, it's like I, it makes me think twice. It's expensive. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. It's public, but it's expensive. Yeah. 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 No, here. Not ah, here. Uh, yeah. uh, I use it every day. <laughs> yeah. it's, because you have to share. Okay. Stick, sticking with the equity thing, the most inequitable part of transportation is how we fund it. And I think this is a kind of a universal. This this can apply to North America. This can apply also in places in Europe. The most inequitable part of transportation yeah. is how we fund it. Yeah. <laughs> Think think of, think about when when you when you pay taxes. Yeah. And where does that where does your revenue, where does that tax money go? What kind of infrastructure? What type of uh, what type of investments? And it will vary. I mean obviously it will vary across the, the globe a lot. All right, everybody. All right, we got five minutes left. All right, let's uh, okay, over here in the over here, yeah. I mean, uh, over here in Quebec City, we are looking uh, to do a new bridge of 10 billion for like 20,000 people passengers. So, for sure, if you look at all the money we do invest in bridges, highways, and stuff like that, 
for sure. I mean, how we found it, people don't re realize it, but it's so way compared to any other uh, mobility service. All right, over here. To challenge that, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're funding roads yeah. which and highways, which are used by car owners, yeah. and that in itself could lead to questions on equity and who has access right. to a car and who can, who can, but I'm saying that also, to be, to it's, be. it's that's so, it, that sounds like you kind of agree. But I don't, but I don't, but I don't, but I don't, but I don't. So I also think that, you know, we, you can have all of the money in the world to fund your transit, but if you don't distribute it properly, if you don't, but price it properly. Hold on, hold on, let it, let it finish, let it finish. So I, there are just so many other things that go into like how you fund transit. You could you could give transit all the money in the world. Every every mode could have the same amount of money. And there are still so many ways in which you could go wrong and, and just not serve your people. I'm sure, okay, go ahead. And, no, 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 no. and I guess that to support that, that, that is because you don't have an equity lens with it. It is mm -hmm. just like funding, it is not the most but it's a mo it is not the most unequitable part of it. It is yeah. the lack of an equity lens, right? Okay. It is it is it okay. is how you analyze the policies and, and yeah. that with an intentionality of that. Okay. And like how the system itself was developed over yeah. decades, yeah. which of course is a piece of funding is like yeah. is a huge reason yeah. why that happened. But like the most inequitable part of transportation is how like how it was built decades and decades. There, there you go. There you go. In my opinion. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point. I always like. I mean, the one that, and then we'll jump over here. I always like it, what the I don't know the thing that but one of the things that bugs me a lot is when I go to get on public transport, I have to pay every time I get on it, you know, regardless. If I get in my car and go get on the, the the highway, the expressway, the road, it's free. And yet my, ta my taxes went to build the road, they also went to build the transport, so why did I then have to pay just to use the transport as opposed to the road? Now, okay, we can debate that, I'm sure, as well. But, okay, over, over here. That was my point, just to be fair for me, it would have to be toll everywhere. So you cross a bridge, you, you have to pay a toll to, to get there. It's not free, so for me, this is the difference. Okay, let's see, are you, are you? Yeah. I, I've, I've just done an analysis of uh, tax revenues in Montreal based on where you are, and downtown is producing lots of money for the city, and they are consuming much less in terms of road infrastructure than the suburbs, for example. So that's exactly, and for those who know, there is a company named Urban3 who's done the same analysis with strong towns for several cities in, in, in the US, and it's the same result. And so, the, the way money is allocated currently is not based on equity, it's based on how much force it will give me. And, people, and usually, because of how the voting system is done, suburbs and, and wait a lot in votes. So usually we end up with inequity, inequity because of that. Okay, sorry, moving on. I like this one. So. <laughs> Okay, autonomous vehicles. We've, we've, if you've noticed, we've moved beyond micromobility. I hope you'll all bear with me here. But uh, autonomous vehicles will make cities safer, less congested, and more livable. Easy. <laughs> easy. Easy, easy. There's always one. You need another All right, all right, Get, start, us, start us off here. Well, I see you too. It's just a reality today. What we read about Tesla, about the others. Uh, there's always some uh, new info about some uh, accidents and necessity to have a, a guy in a car to to check out if everything's okay. But when we will reach some uh, level three or four, or I don't know which one of autonomy, uh, it's a discussion we had also with some uh, some guys here about uh, uh, autonomous uh, drone. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be, of course, uh, safer. And the algorithm, you know, uh, are very efficient. And just an example, which is a reality today, is are they making some reliable experience about semi-autonomous uh, uh, trucks, uh, displacement on highway, and so on. And this could be easily uh, put into the city with car close to another one. You know, you, we don't need to go to full autonomy to make it efficient even today. Good point, good point. Okay, all right. Uh, AI is safer, I think, than humans, so yes. <laughs> but 
the other part why yeah. I'm in the middle. Yeah. It won't be, my, I mean, there's autonomous LRT now, the REM of here, so you can do more and more train. I mean, no uh, drivers, no, so it can help. But yes, if you take one autonomous car, BS, one human car, I mean, at the end, it's not less than just. Okay. So it may help safety, but we're by safety yeah. and also autonomous LRT, that's yeah. increased uh, the numbers Perfect. of. Uh, Perfect. Yeah. All right. That's great. Yeah. All right. The crap. Because it was a mass transportation, so if you, if you have like a lot of autonomous vehicle, you still have a lot of vehicle on the street. Yes. So yeah, it sure. be, uh, if, and the the the, the way that I have some experience what you've done, so the way you are using an uh, autonomous car, yeah. that uh, you are using. It's more than the normal car because uh, we are less. Uh, um, is this so, so what you're telling me is that if we put all the cars, autonomous cars, just in tunnels under the city, yeah, it, won't solve, <laughs> it won't solve congestion. <laughs> Oh. Because, because oh, of the yes. actually, actually, autonomous car. Do you know we have the, the issue is that we have like less than one people, uh, only one people by, by car right now. Yep. With autonomous car, we have about less than one people in the car. Yep. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Good point. <laughs> okay, you have been a, a fantastic uh, participatory <laughs> audience. You've now, thank, thank you, you have yourself, thank you. Uh, our time has come to an end. You've now all done part of a human mobility spectrogram, so you can go home and tell your friends and family. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that's, uh, I think that, that's it. Unless you have any last dying, uh, dying remarks, or don't actually die, but uh, any last remarks, um, thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think about winter.